Have you ever contemplated the ultimate success secret? Like if there were an ultimate success secret, an ultimate secret to success, what would that be? Well, I've contemplated what the ultimate success secret is, but before I tell you what I believe the ultimate success secret is, I have to tell you what I believe the definition of success is. Because if, if I start talking about success and I don't define it, I'm going to be talking about one thing. You're going to be thinking about another thing. And as my daughter says so eloquently, the biggest problem in communication is thinking that it happened. Right? And then no communication happened because I'm talking about one thing and you're thinking about another thing. So I'm going to define success. I believe that the ultimate success in your life and in my life, the ultimate success is discovering the purpose for which God created you, developing yourself for that purpose because you are not ready already for the thing that God has ready for you. You're not ready yet. You have to develop yourself. So we, we discover the purpose for which God created us. We develop ourselves for that purpose, and then we deploy ourselves in that purpose. And when we do that, we're successful. Sometimes that success turns into a lot of money. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes that success turns into happily ever after. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes that success turns into a lot of influence. Sometimes it does not. Sometimes that success turns into worldwide fame. Sometimes it does not. And see, the thing, before you can ever, I believe, discover the purpose for which you were created, you have to yield yourself to that purpose before you know what it is. In other words, when God shows me what I'm here to do, whether it's painful, whether it's difficult, whether it's climbing a high mountain, whether it's dying a brutal death, whether it's living um, a painful life, whatever it is, when God reveals to me the purpose for my life, I have to be yielded to it, and I have to be willing to be yielded to it before I know what it is. And see, some of us want the details before we make the decision, right? God desires the decision before he will reveal the details. How do I know that? Because the scripture says, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, which means doing the will comes before knowing the doctrine. If you're not doing the things he's already shown you, he's not in the habit of showing more stuff to the people who ignored the last stuff he told them. How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down to talk to me? So, so I'm going to read a passage to you that doesn't seem like a passage about success at all, but it really is. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Okay, it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Watch what happens next. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Why was it good? Because God said, let there be light, and it did what he said do, and therefore it was good. Are y'all tracking? Okay, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and the light God, uh, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made a firmament, firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And uh, so it's, it's really interesting. In, in English, when we say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens sounds like the sky, right? The heavens and the earth. But in the Bible, in, in Hebrew, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it says, brashit bara Elohim et hashamayim, hashamayim. Hashamayim is the sky waters. So the heavens were the sky waters. And so... If you, if you, I don't know if you remember reading this when you read about the flood or not. This is all parenthetical. It is not essential to anything I'm covering, except, like, I think that the first objective when we're reading the Bible, I think the first objective should be to become familiar with what it's saying, right? I, if I don't, I, I'm, I'm sorry, familiar with what it says. If I don't know what it says, how will I ever learn what it's saying, right? I have to first, like, I have to know David from, I have to know David from Solomon. I have to know I have to know Joseph, um, Jacob's son, from Joseph, the husband of Mary, from Joseph of Arimathea. I have to become familiar with the, the text, right? So that's the first thing that has to happen. So it says, Skywatch. And you'll remember when the, when the flood came, it says, 
that the fountains of the great deep were broken up, right? And I don't know if this is what happened, but it seems like what could have happened, um, that the fountains of the great deep were bl- broken up, and then water just gushed out of the earth and went up and broke the firmament that was above the water, above the heavens, and then the water rained, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, that's potentially, ostensibly, what happened. Okay, now, so it says Skyward, but I'm going to keep reading because I, I want you to see how awesome this is. Um, and verse 7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters which are under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed whose fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and God saw that it was good. So I want you to notice I want you to notice three phrases that keep happening over and over. Okay, y'all ready? And God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. And God said, and it was so, and God said that it was good. And God saw that it was good. God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. When, when, When God looks at your life, if you want him to see something good, what has to happen is you have to determine that when he says something to you, now I'm not just talking about logos word, I'm not just talking about what the word says, I'm talking about the rhema word, what he's actually saying, what it means, what it's telling us we should be doing. When we find something in scripture that shows us what we should be doing, we should start doing it immediately. When we find something in scripture that shows us what we shouldn't be doing, we should stop doing it immediately. Are y'all tracking? <clears throat> okay. So, so, so God said it was so. God saw it was good. So the, what is the ultimate success formula? The ultimate success formula is studying for the purpose of applying the word of God. Ultimate success formula. People, like, I, I think sometimes people misunderstand why I do what I do. So, Myron, why do you always talk about God? Well, because he is everything. Um, He's the everythingness of everythingness. Myron, why do you teach business from a biblical perspective? Because if I want my clients to succeed, that's their best chance. Like, like not in some, excuse me, not in some religious sense, but in a real, practical, everyday sense. When I think about the fact that my life is where it is, and I look at my life at where it was, it doesn't make sense. There's no logical explanation why this kid who was born to poor, hardworking parents, contracted polio before he was a year old, ADD, ADHD, A, B, C, D, E, F, D, G, okay? I, like, the, if I went to school today, they sent me home with the whole alphabet. Your son has the alphabet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you mean? He's got ADD, ADHD, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He's got the whole thing. Um, anyway. I know. (laughs) Okay. Hey, thanks for watching this video. I hope you're enjoying it, but I want to take some time to invite you to join us at the Make More Offers Challenge. The Make More Offers Challenge, we do it once a month where I invite a bunch of entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs to come and have me teach them in detail the four moves that can scale any business. I want to invite you to join us on the Make More Offers Challenge. Click the link in the description below. You will be glad you did. Join as a VIP and make the rest of your life the best of your life. And now, back to the video you are watching. So... Um, I'm colorblind. I can't run. Right? I've got all this stuff. I'm I'm not I didn't do great in school. Like there's there's no outward implication that this dude is going to do anything like that will even help him survive, <laughs> let alone thrive. And to be a person who guides other people in a way that blesses their life beyond anything they could have imagined. And I'm not, it's not because of me. I promise you, I promise you it's not because of me, but it's in spite of me. But it's because of a decision I made a long time ago, and that is when I find something in the Bible 
and God tells me to do it, I'm going to do my best to do it. And, and, and one of the first things I noticed after I came to Christ and I started studying the Bible, one of the first things I noticed was that was not what everybody was into. Like even all the preachers that I knew weren't into it. I'm like, this is fascinating. Like you think you have a better idea than God. How could that possibly be possible? Like, really, how could that possibly be? I don't think it is. And so, 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 so what is the ultimate success formula? Like become a diligent student of the word of God and apply it to your life. Find a principle. Go look through Proverbs. Look through Genesis. Look through like the New Testament, the Old Testament. Where? Look through the Torah. Look, all, find a principle. Go start doing it and pay attention. Like that. Just start doing it and pay attention. So I'm going to tell a story that I probably told before. Like after I came to Christ, they kind of, the guy who led me to Christ, Dr. Stan Harris, he spoke at um, Offer Mastery Live. He didn't, um, he kind of tricked me because he didn't tell me I was going to have to start reading the Bible until afterwards, right? <laughs> and, and I wasn't feeling it. Like I didn't read anything that wasn't a karate book or a comic book. Nothing. Now I've read hundreds of books, hundreds and hundreds of books. But I didn't read anything that wasn't a karate book or a comic book. And then I, start, I have to start reading this big, thick book with these little bitty words and two p columns and no pictures. And I'm like, this does not seem like it's going to be a good time. <laughs> right? And I started noticing that it told me to do something and said, if you do this, this is what you can expect. And then I started testing those principles. And it started working exactly like it said it. And I felt like, this is crazy. Like, this is amazing. If people knew, like, this is the ultimate cheat code. The ultimate cheat code. The God who created everything gave us content, a document that shows us how everything works if we will study it. And there are so many layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of this truth that it almost can't be comprehended. But if you will just trust that it is truth and apply it like it's truth and live like it's truth, you will be blown away at how exponentially better the quality of your life gets. By the way, exponentially better the quality of your life getting may not mean you're gonna be driving a Lamborghini. It just means you're gonna have fulfillment because you're gonna be doing the thing you were created for. I'm going to get into that in a minute, but I want you to wrap your mind around the fact, like, why do I talk about the Bible? Because my hope is that somebody will become inspired enough to start reading, studying, meditating on, memorizing Bible verses, to apply, not just so they can do it as a religious exercise, but for the purpose of applying it to every day of their life, every relationship in their life, everything they do in their life. That's what my, that's what my hope is from me speaking at a conference with 3,000 people, 7,000 people, 5,000 people, 35,000 people, and talking about the Bible, and talking about God, and talking about the principles that I've discovered in the Word of God, and without, without apologizing for it. I'm not going to apologize for it. Y'all ask me to speak. If you don't want the Bible, you, you don't want me. Invite somebody else. I'm cool with that. I'm not looking for work. Right? And, and I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that from a place of arrogance. I'm just saying it from a place of ownership. I own my assignment. This is my assignment. This is what I'm here to do. I'm not going to do something different because people, I just feel so uncomfortable. Well, go make yourself comfortable. That's not, your comfort is not my responsibility. <laughs> now, if you've got a problem with me because of my disposition, that's a problem I need to fix. Like, if I'm just a jerk, and I'm obtuse, and hard to get along with, just as a matter of course, that's my problem, I need to fix it. But if you got a problem with my position, that's your problem, you go fix it. Because this ain't that. And I ain't he. <laughs> right, I'm not even gonna try to fix it. But you don't understand, you made me feel, I didn't make you feel anything, you did that all by yourself. I promise you, there's nobody who can make me feel anything. I mean, if you, like, injure me, I might feel something. But I mean, say something, you're going to do something, you're doing your things to make me feel a certain way. Okay. Like, I am just who I am. I don't, I don't, 
here's what, here's, what, here's what we can do. Here's what we can learn how to do. We can learn how to speak the truth in love. Wow. Truth and love can exist in the same place, in the same person, at the very same time. What? I was in Pennsylvania last week. Um, and I was playing golf with Keith Whitman, a friend of mine. And, this, and the, the golf course ask us, me and Keith and my brother-in-law, John, and the golf course asked us if we'd let this guy, other guy play with us that we didn't know. Keith said yes. I personally would have asked some questions first, but it is what it is. I'm just keeping it real. I just know me, right? So we're playing, we get to the third hole. Dude takes out a cigarette. I'm like, bro, are you gonna smoke that? Now I don't mind you smoking. I just don't wanna breathe it. So I said, as kind as I could, hey, like if you need to smoke, I get it, do you but we're gonna let you go ahead and we're gonna play without that because I don't wanna breathe that. Now that's not, I'm not being rude. I wasn't rude at all. I wasn't being obtuse, but I like, if that's what you wanna do, I got a three-year-old granddaughter who I wanna dance with her at her wedding. I don't want your secondhand smoke to be the cause of my demise so that I can't dance with my granddaughter at her wedding. Now, some people may think, well, that's just too much, Myron. It's too much for you. It's not too much for me because me, wanting to dance with my granddaughter at a wedding and not wanting to breathe their secondhand smoke is more important to me than your feelings being hurt because I'm willing to tell you with other, what other people in your life are not willing to tell you, but they're thinking it. Is that too, y'all track it, okay. So you don't have, just because you disagree with somebody don't mean you have to be mean about it, right? You could smile and say, you know what? That's not gonna work. <laughs> We're not gonna be able to do that like that today, right? Okay, so. So, um, we've defined success. The ultimate success secret is to become a student of the Word of God. I believe, like, like I'm smart, but I'm not really smarter than you. I'm not really smarter than the average person. I'm average smartness on the smartness meter. Mine's, like, probably in the middle, right? Right? But the advantage that I have that makes people think I'm smart is the fact that I have wisdom. And the wisdom that I have is based on the knowledge that I have and the understanding that I have. And if you understand that, 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 that ignorance is the pr first prerequisite of wisdom, right? Ignorance is the absence of truth. Knowledge is the accumulation of truth. So uh, that's, wh that's why we need to read the Bible so we can accumulate truth. Understanding is the assimilation of truth. Now I comprehend the truth that I've collected. Okay. Then um, we have the wisdom is the application of truth. So I discover that something's true. I apply it really, really fast. And people think, you're smart. No, I'm not smart. I'm wise because I've applied the truth. And wisdom is probably smarter than smart. And here's what I mean by that. Wisdom is smarter than smart. When I discover truth, because truth belongs to God to the point where he makes himself synonymous with truth. Like if you think about numbers, right? The, if you think about the number system, like one is the number of unity, the unity of God. I, like God is one. But two is the number of separation or holiness. Three is the number of God. Well, three times three is nine, and nine is the number for truth. Why is three the number for God? I believe because of what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So, so the number for God, they're three, but they're one, but you take that three. So what is truth? Truth is God squared, right? Or, or, or God, yeah, yeah, square root. Yeah, God squared. Three times three is nine. Nine is such an amazing number um, when you think about it. Because like three, three, four is the number of the earth, five is the number of grace, also the number of um, I mean, five is the number of grace, six is the number of falsehood, also the number of man, seven is the number of completion, eight is the number of abundance, infinity, eternity, and the new beginning, nine is the number for truth. Well, it's really interesting because somebody, somebody made a comment on my YouTube channel when I was talking about nine a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how everything answers to nine, right? Like nine is the number for truth because all the other numbers have to answer to it, right? Because one plus, I mean, um, like nine plus zero is nine, or um, um, two times, two times, one times nine is nine, two times nine is 18, 18 is a one and an eight, one plus eight is nine, three times nine is 27, two plus seven is nine, four times nine is 
36, 3 plus 6 is 9, and you keep on doing that. Then somebody made this post, and it blew my mind, right? So I'm, I'm going to share what they said. I wish I could remember the person's name who said it. But they said, so if you think about the fact that there are 60 seconds in a minute, right? And there are 60 minutes in an hour. Did you know that if you take 60 times 60, I think this is right, 60 times 60 is 3,600. 3, 60 times 60 is 3,600. 3 plus 6 plus 0 plus 0 is 9. But wait a minute. There's, there are 24 hours in a day, right? So there's 60 times 24. I think that's 1,440. It is 1,440. 1 plus 4 plus 4 is 9. It's, it's like nine is the number for truth. And, and when, the sooner we wrap our minds around the idea that ultimately the truth is the truth. And by the way, there's 24 hours in a day. And then if you take the number of hours in a day times the number of days in a week times the number of weeks in a year, it's still going to come out to something that when you add them all together, it ends up to be nine. It's just like everything answers to nine because everything answers to the truth. You don't have to like the truth. Eventually, you will yield to it. You'll either yield to it on this side or you'll yield to it on the other side. But everybody's going to yield to the truth. Like, not liking something is not, it doesn't matter. It is what it is. Now, having said all of that, I believe that we're looking for multiple things. When we study the scripture, there's so much depth of truth in scripture that it just keeps on going deeper and deeper. Like, we read Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. Wait, like... In fact, I'm going to give you the outline, understanding of the outline that I have as far as how to feel fulfilled in life. Why do most people feel empty? Because one of the three main components of their purpose is missing. Or all three of the main components of their purpose are missing. So just know that when God created us, so in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to write a couple of things up here for starters. Okay, so one... So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we're, I'm going to write creation, and then I'm going to write categories. Right? So God created categories in creation. He created three categories. What are they? Number one, he created creation. Creation is the sun, the moon, the stars, the air, the water. It is the um, trees, the rocks. Creation, it's just stuff. God created creation. The second thing he created, he created creatures. Creatures are dogs and cats and chimpanzees and alligators and, um, and crocodiles and lions and tigers and bears, oh no, creatures, right? So God created creatures. Um, and then the last thing that God created was he created, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use two words here, he created creative creators. Now, when he created, so this is, this is stuff. This is like animals and insects. This is people. Now, here's what's amazing. These three categories are very, very different. And God delegated some of his work to all of them. So God, when God created, when God created creation, he created the land. We heard, we read about that a few minutes ago. He created the sea, but then he delegated the bringing forth of the animals. The land brought forth the animals or the beast animals, right? The sea brought forth the birds and the fish. So that's, so that's what, that's what the creation brought forth. So creation, he delegated some of the work to creation. But guess what? Creation doesn't have the ability to intentionally reproduce. What do I mean? Like, like animals intentionally reproduce. Human beings intentionally reproduce. Plants don't intentionally reproduce. They, have, they need an outside agent to disturb the environment so that pollinization can happen. Are y'all tracking? Like, and, and 80% of, 20% of pollinization happens because of wind and water. 80% of pollinization happens because of animals and insects. Okay, so creatures, he created animals. So he delegated, he delegated these to produce stuff. He delegated animals to do things. Like animals exist for the purpose of doing things. That's what animals do. They do things. 
right? But humans, he created us to create things. Now, the creation that we do, um, the creation that we do is not the same as the creation that God did. So God created ex nihilo or bara, bara in Hebrew, ex nihilo in Greek, which means he created everything out of nothing. Okay? We don't have the ability to do that. We only have the ability to create out of something. Right? People say, no, no, I created this out of an idea that I had in my head. Yeah, but you had to have the language that you used in your head and the pictures that you saw in your head existed before you created them in your head. So we have the ability to create out of something. We don't have the ability to create out of nothing. That's why, by the way, man is not a higher form of animal. I remember when I was like in elementary school, I came home from school one day and my mom used to always say the same thing. Would you learn school today, baby? I learned that we're a higher form of animal. My mom said, don't you ever say that again. You're not an animal. You're made in the image of God. Like, I didn't know why she was so bent out of shape, but I'm glad she was because that left a mark on me. My mom was not having it. She was not having me talk about it. And, and so and, and if you look at the animalistic behaviors that people practice today, a part of that reason is because back in the 1960s, they started teaching children that we're a higher form of animal. We're not a higher form of animal. We're, we're way more a lower form of God than we are a higher form of animal. The, the, the Hebrew word for animal is bahema, which means in it is what it is, which means a horse is a horse is a horse, of course. Anyway, which, which means that all a horse can do is what a horse could do the first day a horse got here. All a dog can do is what a dog could do the first day a dog got here. All a cat can do is the first, the, the, all the things, like everything a cat was ever going to be able to do, it could do it on day one. Human beings were created to create, which means just that by itself, our lives are progressively productive. The nature of our lives is progressive productivity. Our lives are supposed to get better. Today's supposed to be better than yesterday. This week's supposed to be better than last week. This month's supposed to be better than last month. This year's supposed to be better than last year. Like, if you're not progressively, produ like progressively producing, then you miss something somewhere in the first command, which came thousands of years before the Ten Commandments, was the first command. Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. It's in Genesis chapter one. Be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue, have dominion. Be, do, have. That's the formula. Okay. Now, if you want to be, like, if you want to look at fulfillment, since God, since we as human beings are made in the image of God, the better understanding we have of God, the better understanding we have of ourselves. Ah. That's why the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Like, I'm supposed to contemplate God. Do you know animals can't contemplate God? Trees can't contemplate God? Which brings me to the three stages of fulfillment in the lives of human beings. So, Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought this. I've thought this many times. Why would he do that? Because the scripture later tells us that God is self-existent. He's self-sufficient. He's self-satisfied. He needs nothing. So if you need nothing, why would you make something? Are y'all tracking? Does that, make, does that question make sense? I don't need anything. If I don't need anything, why would I make something? Well, the only answer I've been able to discover is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because he is creative and therefore it is his nature to create. If you are creative, it behooves you to create. Right? So, so the first thing God tells about himself is not that he's love. He's love, but it's not the first thing he says. He's omnipotent, but that's not the first thing he says. He's omniscient, but that's not the first thing he says. He's omnipresent, that's not the first thing he says. The first thing he says is in the beginning God created. The first thing God tells about God is that he's creative. The first thing God tells us about man, and when I say man, I'm talking about men and women, is that he created us in his image, which means he created us to create stuff, and he made us to make stuff. That's why you're here. You are here to exercise your God-likeness in creativity. That's why little kids love making things. Why? It's in them. It's just in them. They can't not make stuff because they're made in the image of God. So the first, like, if, we want, if you want to feel fulfilled... You have to, this is, where, this is where fulfillment comes from. And success, like, oh, this person's successful, but they're unfulfilled. They feel miserable. Well, they're not successful then. They may be rich. 
and unsuccessful. You can be rich and unsuccessful. How does that work? Well, you make a lot of money, but you don't create anything. Or you make a lot of money, you don't do the second one. Or you make a lot of money, you don't do the third one. So the first one, create. So, so create something. When I create something, and in fact, I'm not even going to write create. I'm going to write creation. So creation is the first thing that, oops, I did the wrong thing. I went to the wrong page. So creation is the first thing that makes me feel fulfilled. Because I make something, and now I can look at this thing that I made. I'm like, I made that. When I was a kid, I liked to put together model cars. Why? I made it. As an adult, my first business was like rebuilding cars. I did like, I, I could take an old raggedy car and I could take the engine out, didn't run and put another engine in, it did run. Or I could take a car that was raggedy and I could do body work on it and, and paint it. And then I did that, right? Um, as an author, I take some thoughts that are in my head and I put them down on some paper and I get them printed and it becomes a book and I created that. And like the, the feeling that you get when you hold your first published book in your hand, it's like, I did this, right? Why, 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 do, why do you even care that much to be, feel all that great about what you did? Because you created it. It, like when we create things, it makes us feel fulfilled because we're exercising our God likeness. But guess what? God created three categories. He created creation. Guess what? Creation didn't even know God created it. It was just there. And God could enjoy it for himself and with himself and by himself. But it was, it was just creation. Then he created creatures. And creatures could do stuff with the creation, but they didn't know he was there. They're totally unaware of God. They're totally unaware of themselves. Huh. So some, as weird as this sounds, when God created the heavens and the earth, something was missing. What was missing? What was missing was connection. God created creation, but God could not connect with creation. God couldn't connect with creation. God couldn't cre connect with creatures. But when God made man, he had somebody he could create, connect with. How do I know? Because the scripture says that the, um, that says the voice of the Lord walked with man in the garden in the cool of the day. There's that connection. When God made man, God, when God created everything, he said, and God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good, and God said it was good, so, and God saw that it was good, and God said, and it was so, and God saw it was good. What's the first thing God said wasn't good? Is that a good question? It's not good for man to be alone. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Now, other than the fact that God is God and God knows everything, how does God know that it's not good for man to be alone? Because he made the image of God and it wasn't good for God to be alone. So God created man for a, first and foremost, for a connection with God. But because man's made in the image of God, and God created creation, and God created man to create more things, he knew that the man was going to need someone to connect with who could appreciate the fact that he had created it with him. So he put Adam under heavenly anesthesia, took a rib out, made the woman, brought her to the man, woke him up, and said, Adam, I got something for you. Adam said, let's go. <laughs> right? And so, so now man has someone to connect with. He has a woman. Okay, so what happens between the man and the woman? Well, now the man can take care of the woman. The woman can take care of the man. But guess what? Then they have these little babies. And it's, it's really interesting because even before we get to that, we won't even get to the babies yet. Here's what, so you got, you, got, you got God created man. Man's yielded to God. Man's walking with God in the garden in the cool of the day. What happens next? Uh, man severs the connection between him and God. How does he do that? When he stopped doing what God said and did what the serpent said. So man severed the connection. And guess what man did after he severed the connection? He tried to widen that separation. What did he do? He did two things. He made himself fig leaves. So fig leaves together to cover the fact that he was naked, his self-consciousness, to cover his vulnerability, to cover his self-consciousness, to try and cover up the fact that he messed it up. And then he, what else did he do? He hid himself from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So he's widening the separation of that disconnection. But what did God do? It said, and the Lord made coats of skin, which means there had to be a what? Sacrifice. 
Something had to die to restore the connection. And that's the final piece, and that is, oops. The final piece is, that brings fulfillment, is contribution. So, contribution. What is a contribution? God gave a sacrifice, which is a type, it was a foreshadowing, a picture of the fact that one day God himself would be that sacrifice. For unto us, a child is born. Unto, uh, I mean, unto, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He shall be called mighty, mighty God, counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. It's a foreshadowing of Christ, the contribution. So God had to give a contribution to restore the connection. So the connection can only be restored, the connection can only be restored with a contribution. Now here's what happens. This is, this is truly, this is truly the cycle of life. Connection, I mean creation, connection, contribution. Creation, connection, contribution. You will feel fulfilled, you create something. You create it, nobody's there to appreciate it with you. It like becomes harder for you to appreciate over time by yourself unless you got somebody there who can appreciate it. Like a lot of us who are entrepreneurs, we, we join masterminds, why? Where there are other people who think like us who can appreciate the things that we've accomplished as we share them with each other, right? Whereas if you talk to your next door neighbor about it, they're like, that's weird, right? Um, <laughs> right, so contribution. So what happens? Now you've got the man and the woman, they come together the connection between them creates new life in the form of a child. Guess what? The child can't take care of itself. Can't feed itself, can't hold its own head, can't, can't, can't change itself, can't clean itself. So it has to have parents that contribute. So now the contribution of the two parents sustain the life of the child. And the cycle starts all over again. Creation, connection, contribution. You're connected to the child. You're contributing to the child. Until what? Until the child can go out and create on their own. And then they establish their own connections. And then establish their own um, contributions. And we keep doing that over and over and over and over and over. Creation, connection, contribution. Creation, connection, contribution. And you, if, you have, if you have creation, creation, a lot of times will pay you a lot of money. But you have no connection. Like you, you spend so much time in the creation that you abandon your family to go do that. And now you sever the connection. And so now, because you sever the connection and you end up in divorce court, now your spouse gets half. And so now the thing that you were working all this time to create because you lack the ability to, to, to build and, and nurture a connection, you lose half of what you created. And then you, everything that you make, you try to hold on to it with both fists until you don't ever wanna give anything, but, but you don't ever wanna give anything, any contribution to anyone or anything else. You just wanna get all you can, can all you get and sit on your can, right? But watch what happens. We have been taught erroneously that accumulation is the same as wealth. Accumulation of money is the same as wealth. But it's not. In Israel, if you go to Israel, one of the things you'll do is you'll go to the Sea of Galilee, which is in the northern part of the country. You'll go to the Sea of Galilee, and you might go out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, which is really amazing. Then maybe later on, while you're on that trip, you'll go down to the River Jordan where John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. And the River Jordan flows from the Sea of Galilee all the way down till it empties in the Dead Sea. Why is the Dead Sea called the Dead Sea? For one reason. It only has an inlet and accumulation. It has no outlet. And that's why it's dead. Until you understand that money should be flowing, it's more important to have cash flow in a business than it is to have accumulation of a lot of cash in a business. I'd rather, like if I had to choose, I would rather have, I would rather have zero money accumulated and a million dollars of cash flow than a million dollars accumulated and zero cash flow. Fortunately, I don't have to choose. We can have, you can have both. <laughs> but if I had to choose, I understand that cash flow is more important than accumulation. So many people don't understand that. And that's why they live, there are so many people who are saving up all of their money and accumulating as much money as they can for as long as they can so that one day they can retire when they're too tired to do anything that they saved up all that money to go do. Just cash flow that money cash flow it so that it turns into something that you can use while you still have the energy and vibrancy to enjoy it. 
like I have no desire to retire. I mean, I mean maybe you do, but I don't. I, yeah, I have retirement accounts, but only because it saves me money on taxes. Otherwise, my, it's like, I don't want, and the fact that I want to have something to leave to my children. I'm like, I'm not accumulating wealth for myself. Like, the Bible says clearly, lay not up, lay not up for yourselves treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves do break through and steal. So I've got to end this video now. Hopefully something I said in that big, long ramble about creation, connection, and contribution was helpful. How do you be successful? Discover the will of God for your life, their purpose for your life. Develop yourself for that purpose. Deploy yourself in that purpose. And when you do that, you will be both happy and fulfilled and successful. Stay blessed by the best. I'm out. I've got a coaching call that starts in right now. I'm out of here. See y'all later.